Hello, everyone. As always, a great privilege and an honor it is to be able to share God's Word with you. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open it up to Matthew chapter 15. We're going to be in that, uh, in the entire chapter of Matthew in our lesson today for BSF. Uh, and if you know a little bit about me and the way I like to structure uh, the lectures that I give, I always like to start things out with a question. So the question that I'm going to start out with today is where do you find your life? Where do you find your life? So this might sound a little bit of, pro of a probing question, a mysterious question, but let me expand on that a little bit more. Where do you find your strength for every day? Where do you find your reason for living, your hope when life brings you uncertainties and great difficulties? Where do you find your satisfaction? Where do you find your contentment? Now, these are deep questions, and they certainly require a lot of time of quiet reflection to think about these, but they can all sound up, I th they can all be summed up by thinking that question of where do you find your life? Now, for the believer, for the one who has placed their trust in Jesus Christ, that answer should be simple, right? Our life, the object of our faith, the foundation of all our living should be Christ. But what we'll discover in Matthew 15 is that life offers us many distractions, so many things that are less honorable and less worthy of adoration than Jesus. You know, we as humans, we can get up, caught up in our own traditions, our preferences, our own desires, our ambitions, that we actually get tied into things that actually steal true life from us. Now, we're going to be reminded that not only is true life found only in Jesus, the life that our soul needs, but also that we face a great obstacle and a great predicament. So I want you to think of two, this lecture today in really two parts, and that's how we're going to divide today's lecture. The, fir the first part is about Jesus and his interaction with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law as, a, as exposing a reality that is grim, exposing a problem that is far more serious than we could have thought. But in the second part of this lecture, right, so we have the problem. Now Jesus gives us the true hope and provides the solution to that grim problem in reality. So that's going to be our two divisions. So the first part, right, is the honest truth. From Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 20, the first division is going to be life's great predicament. Life's great predicament in verses 1 through 20. And then the latter half of Matthew 15, verses 21 through 39, division two, life's glorious hope. So let's dive in here to life's great predicament. Let me pray for us real quick, and then we'll dive in to Scripture. Uh, Lord God, you give us just these few brief moments to be in your Word. Um, you give me the privilege to share your Word. You give others uh, the opportunity to listen to your Word. God, I pray that it would not be my words, but your words. Uh, God, through your Spirit, Lord, I pray that you would work in all of our hearts uh, to walk away with what you want us to take away from these this scripture passage, Lord, and at the end of the day, God, that we would find our life, our true life, in you and you alone. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to share your word and to hear your word. It's in your son's great name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, first division, Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 20, life's great predicament. So if we think back to last week's lesson, Matthew chapter 14, we concluded with Jesus walking on water, right? Peter goes out on the water to meet Jesus, and the disciples end up declaring that Jesus is the Son of God. One of the biggest takeaways from last week's lesson is that Jesus is indeed our Savior. And as we've studied, studied in Matthew, I think it's interesting, right, that we, we encounter these ebbs and flows of these high points of Jesus' ministry where people are praising him and declaring him to be the Messiah, and then we hit another low point of earthly opposition to his ministry. And this week is going to be no different. Um, so Jesus just fed the 5,000 plus, right, in Matthew chapter 14. He has these incredible healings, these miracles. He walks on water. He continues to demonstrate that he is the Son of God. And then in Matthew 15, he is again confronted by his main opponents, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Now, the Pharisees, as we read in these opening verses of Matthew 15, are coming all the way from Jerusalem, Jerusalem to meet Jesus where he is. When we talked about this as a leadership circle at our leaders meeting this past week, and, and one of uh, our teaching leaders actually mentioned it's very interesting, it's significant that these Pharisees and teachers of the law are coming from Jerusalem. Jerusalem 
If you think about it in that time, it is the epicenter, right, of the Jewish faith. It is the epicenter of thought, of religious practice, of religious philosophy. It is uh, an elite city, right? It is the main city that everybody looks to for direction. Jerusalem is a big deal. So they're coming from Jerusalem with authority, right, as Pharisees and teachers of the law, and they're coming to challenge Jesus once again. Now, the Pharisees accuse this time of uh, Jesus' disciples of not ceremonially washing their hands before they eat. Now, this is a little bit different than us, uh, us washing our hands before dinner. Uh, this is actually part of religious tradition to ceremonially wash your hands before you eat. And Jesus' disciples apparently were not doing that. But Jesus, in verses 3 through 6, immediately calls out the hypocrisy, hypocrisy right? There, you can't get anything past Jesus. Like, nothing gets past Jesus. And he actually points out a hypocrisy in their own actions, and he points out a situation that was taking place in the lives amongst the religious at that time. Now, Jesus starts this calling out by, by stating one of the Ten Commandments, which is to honor your father and mother, right? One of the Ten Commandments. Now, what was happening at that time was that the religious leaders were using God in tradition as an excuse to not give love and devotion that their parents and their families needed, right? So they could have been saying things like, you know what? I got to give my time, my resources, my money to God. They were using God as an excuse rather than love, having compassion and love on their parents. Now, you can't hide from Jesus. You cannot fool him with empty words and promises, right? Jesus knows everything. Nothing gets past him. And you can't use God as an excuse to cover up your selfishness. Jesus sees right past that because he knows everything. And as Jesus is calling out their hypocrisy in this moment, he boldly declares from Isaiah 29, 13, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. And then in Jesus, in verse 11, puts it plainly. What goes into a man's mouth doesn't make him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth, that is what makes him unclean. Now, the disciples point out, again, remember the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, as our, one of our teaching leaders mentioned in our leaders meeting, right? These people are coming from a place of authority. They're coming from the city of authority with Jerusalem. They do have religious clout. They do have prestige in their community. So the disciples or like, Jesus, you offended the Pharisees here. Like, what you said offended them. And Jesus says, pay no bother to them. You know, the fact is, they're the blind leading the blind. And Peter, as Peter often does, presses Jesus on this point a little bit. And he asks Jesus to explain the parable a little bit more. So Jesus expounds on what he means. What is he saying here, right? That it is what comes out of the heart that corrupts rather than what's outside. So what is he saying here? Well, Jesus expands on his thoughts and what he said to the Pharisees uh, in the following ways. So the, the teachers of the law had gotten caught up with so many earthly rituals and traditions that they had forgotten about the reality of sin and the true nature of our depravity. They had forgotten what the prophet Isaiah had said in chapter 64 and verse 6 of Isaiah, where he says, but we are all as unclean things and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Now, the great problem of humanity is not what's on the outside, how we present ourselves to others, but rather it's on the inside. Now, Jesus even goes so far to list some of the stems that, uh, some of the sins that stem from the heart in verse 19 of chapter 15, right? He lists evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. They don't come from our external environment. They stem from what's already in there indwelling sin. It is the very state of our corrupt hearts. That's the big problem. That is the great predicament. It is not necessarily just our external behavior. Now, it's easy for us, right, to cast judgment on the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, right? And I think part of why it's so easy to do that is because they made it their life's mission to study the Old Testament scriptures and yet they still did not recognize who Jesus was, and they totally missed the point of God's redemptive plan for humanity, which just is mind-boggling. But, as we know, the heart can be deceitful, sin can blind you, pride can blind you. 
So it's easy for us, right, to condemn the Pharisees and the teachers of the law in this case. But really, if we think about our current culture, and maybe even many of us who consider ourselves Christians today, how often do we think like the teachers of the law and the Pharisees? How often do we think that it is outward appearance, our external behavior that matters at the end of the day? Let's be honest, right? Jesus completely shatters that idea. He points out the great predicament that indwelling sin is the greatest problem that we humans face. It is, and no ritual, no tradition, no man-made rule can get rid of that problem. Why? Because it's not an external issue. It's an internal issue. It's an issue with the heart. Now, the good news here, and we're going to get to that in the second division, is that the solution to our sinful hearts is far greater, far more magnificent than any solution we could have conjured up on our own. The solution is Christ and Christ alone. And that's going to lead us to our first principle in this section, that sinful hearts can only be cleansed through, the, through true faith in Christ. Sinful hearts can only be cleansed through true faith in Christ. So I'm going to go back briefly to my introduction when I asked that question, where do you find your life? Now, from this passage, it is clear where the Pharisees and the teachers of the law found their life. They found their life in religious tradition. They really didn't think too highly of the problems that they were facing. They didn't think their problems were that significant. They thought that just by simple behavior modification and outward religious action, they'd be good to go before God and, more importantly, before others. Well, they thought little of the significance of sin. They thought little of the reality of God's holiness. They thought little of who God was. How often do we do the same things today? And we know there's a problem in our hearts, right? Look at, look at the culture around us. Even the culture around us would acknowledge that life isn't really the way it should be. We're all trying to compensate for something. We're, we recognize that life is not this perfect ideal, that there is indeed something wrong. But that's as deep and as far as our culture gets when addressing this problem, we don't necessarily recognize as a culture that our problem actually started back in Genesis chapter 3 when our first parents, Adam and Eve, fell into sin, when the fall of mankind took place. We do not go beneath the superficial, so we look to superficial things to fix our life, to save us. And by the way, I have to mention that I've been listening uh, to a podcast, and I'm going to list a few things right that this manifests in our culture and our life today. Um, but I've been listening to a podcast this past week where this pastor has been talking about uh, prayer. And often on the subject of prayer, uh, this pastor has been mentioning, right, that we often try to find uh, our salvation in things that are other than Jesus Christ. This is So this is partly a list that has been ruminating in my mind because of those podcasts and sermons I've been listening to. So if you listen to the same podcast and you start to hear things that are similar in this list that I'm about to provide, there's no coincidence. I'm probably listening to the same podcast you're listening to. So anyways, just with that precursor and ca caveat, some of those things that we look to for salvation other than Christ uh, can be religious traditions, right? Like the Pharisees, external performance, like the Pharisees and teachers of the law, right? We think, as long as I'm attending church, as long as I'm going to Bible study every week, as long as I'm showing up to community group, as long as I'm praying in front of others, I'm okay, I'm good. As long as my Christian friends think I'm doing well, I'm fine, I'm good, I'm good to go. I'm good before God. I mean, if they approve of me, then certainly God approves of me. So that's one way, right? We try to find salvation in our religious traditions, in our external performance. But we look to other secular means for salvation. We look to reputation and popularity, right? If my coworkers or if my friends, if my family members think I'm good, then I'm good to go. Then I'm set, or maybe it's just popularity, right? The amount of people that we know, how full our social calendars can be. If I have a full social calendar, then that means that I'm good. It can manifest itself in money, the pursuit of wealth, ambition, power, sexual fulfillment, people pleasing, certain addictions. The list goes on, right? The list can go on. There are a myriad of ways that we look to salvation for things that are other than Jesus Christ. And then we get frustrated, right? We get frustrated because those things don't ultimately solve what's wrong with us. 
They don't get to the core of our heart. They don't solve our heart issue, which is our biggest issue. And we fail to understand the seriousness of the problem, which is that sin separates us from our creator. That we look to our various addictions, earthly affection, the temporal things around us for a solution. Jesus declares clearly that the great problem humanity faces is not superficial. It is not temporal. The problem that we face is indwelling sin. And the only solution to indwelling sin is Jesus Christ. So we're going to talk about that more in our second division. Um, So I mentioned, right, the first part, the first part of our lecture was going to be talking about the great predicament that we face, the reality, the grim reality that we face as fallen humans, which is sin. And the second part of the lecture is the good news, the glorious news found in Jesus Christ. So let's get to that. I'm needing some good news right about now. So our second division is Matthew 15, uh, verses 21 through 39, life's glorious hope. So this second division, life's glorious hope in verses 21 through 39 of Matthew 15. So verse 21 uh, opens up by telling us that Jesus had uh, chosen a very unique location in this next part of scripture, Tyre and Sidon, which is Gentile territory. If you know a little bit about the Gentiles, um, they didn't necessarily always get along with the Jews. And now, uh, you know, and we know, right, that Jesus does nothing by accident. Every move that he makes, everything that he says, everything that he does has a purpose. It is according to his sovereign will. So there is, it is no accident that he is going to Gentile territory right now. In the next few verses, we start to realize why he chose Gentile territory for his next move. In verse 22, we are introduced to a Canaanite woman who calls out to Jesus. So verse 22 records it in this way. She says, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Hold up. We got to stop there for a second. Did you catch how the Canaanite woman addressed Jesus? Lord, son of David. Now, she could have addressed Jesus as teacher or mighty healer. And none of those things would have been incorrect, right? Jesus is a mighty healer and he is a great teacher. No, but she says, Lord, son of David. Now for some context, let's remember who the Canaanites were. You know, first of all, they were Gentiles. So outside of the nation of Israel. In the Old Testament, they were actually often Israel's foes and enemies. They were pagan worshipers. They practiced abhorrent rituals such as human sacrifice and bizarre sexual practices. That's the history. That's the context to the people group that this woman comes from. This is a pagan woman, part of a group that did not have a history of worshiping the one true God. Quite the opposite. So that's the context here. But do you notice how she's addressing him? Jesus, Lord, she's saying, Lord, son of David. She is identifying Jesus by his true identification, right? This title acknowledges that Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies, the fulfillment of David's throne, that he's indeed the Messiah. This pagan Canaanite woman is addressing him that way. And how about the next phrase, have mercy on me, right? Acknowledging that Jesus can grant mercy, can bestow mercy on humans. She's crying out to the one that she's acknowledging as Messiah, as Lord, as God. Now that is amazing, Now, Jesus' response in this portion of scripture, his response to this woman can sometimes confuse the reader. So we're going to address this a little bit. Your notes address this as well, a little little bit as well. But the, the confusion comes in his responses, which are recorded in verses 24 and verse 26. So verse 24, Jesus says, uh, in response to this woman crying out to him, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Okay, so that's confusing response number one. Then second response in verse 26, Jesus says, Uh, After she pleads with him, the Canaanite woman is continuing to plead uh, with Jesus, and she even gets on her knees before him. And Jesus says, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Okay, (laughs) what's going on here? First of all, is Jesus just dissing this woman, and is he insulting and belittling her? We're going to have to get some context, and we're going to have to dive into these verses a little bit more. First of all, we have to understand Jesus' heart, right? Before we think Jesus is belittling this woman or not having compassion, we need to understand who Jesus is. First of all, he's, he's fully man and fully God. He is perfect in every way. 
And he has tremendous compassion for lost sinners and especially lost sinners outside of the nation of Israel. Think about how he addresses the Gentiles in the next portion of the scripture, which we're about to dive into in a moment, right? He's continuing to be in Gentile territory when he feeds the 4,000 plus, right? He has great compassion on them because they're hungry, they're exhausted, they've been following him, he's been healing them. So it's not that he's, he's not really belittling her. It's not going to turn her away. That wouldn't make sense, right? Because that's not how he addresses other Gentiles. I think about in John chapter 4, right, where he addresses a Samaritan woman. The Samaritans did not exactly get along with the Jews, right? And yet Jesus does not treat her like an enemy. He doesn't uh, dismiss her. Jesus meets the woman of the well and presents to her that he is the the solution, the answer to what she's been looking for. So it's not, Jesus is certainly not dissing or disrespecting this woman, But his responses to her are certainly curious. So let's take the first response, right? The first response in in verse 24, uh, where Jesus says, I've only come for the lost sheep of Israel. Now, this signifies, and again, this is uh, one of our our leaders on the admin team had this incredible point. We were talking about this in our leaders meeting. He actually came up with this point. I thought it was fantastic. And the notes get into it a little bit, but it it is a great, I think it helps in, in putting context to this confusing response that Jesus has, right? So verse 24, I've only come for the lost sheep of Israel. Now we know from the scripture that the gospel, that the redemption for the world was to come to the nation of Israel first, right? Jesus chose Israel first, and then his message was going to spread out to the nations all over the world. So yeah, Jesus is saying the gospel came first to the nation of Israel, right? To the Jews, But it also brings up this greater discussion for maybe the Jewish reader or maybe for his disciples who are witnessing this interaction with the Canaanite woman. It's bringing about, yeah, the gospel came to the nation of Israel first, but it didn't stop there, right? In both the Old and the New Testament, we see Jesus didn't just come to redeem Israel. He comes for the world. Think about Isaiah 56, which by the way, if you have time, read through Isaiah 56. It is an amazing prophecy about how God is grafting in the Gentiles into his salvation promise. But Isaiah says in, in Isaiah 56 that the coming kingdom of the Lord will be made up of all nations, that the Lord Lord will gather the outcasts of Israel. That's amazing, right? Think about it. Many of us, you know, many of you listening to this lecture right now, we're the fulfillment of that promise, of that prophecy. Many of us don't have a Jewish heritage. We are Gentiles. That message of the gospel is the fulfillment on us, right? We came to faith because God is grafting in not just those within Israel. He came to redeem the world. That's amazing. Okay, so that's one point. Opens up this discussion about Jesus didn't just come for the Jews. He came for the Gentiles. He came to redeem the world. And how about this second verse? In, in, in verse 26, uh, he seems to be taking things personal with this Canaanite woman. And again, Jesus is not being disrespectful or dismissive, dismissive truly dismissive at his heart, at his core. That's because that's not who Jesus is. Jesus is a savior of compassion, right? He's perfect. So he's not mocking this Canaanite woman, but he seems to be do some, doing something where he tries to draw her out just a little bit more. He even does this in verse 24 in his first response. He gets her to continue to cry out. He gets her to continue the conversation, to continue to plead before him. He seems to be testing her faith in these verses. Now, this would not be that different than other portions of scripture where God has tested the faith of his people, right? Remember how the Lord tested Abraham's faith as we studied Genesis last year. So this would not be out of the ordinary for God to do. And remember, Jesus is very purposeful and for a reason. He has a particular heart and desire to see this woman come to faith in him. So he continues to draw her out, continues to have her to plead before him. And with these two responses, how does the woman respond? Right? She does exactly what Jesus wants her to do. She doesn't walk away. She doesn't give up. She doesn't say, well, I'm not part of Israel. I'm not part of that initial promise. So you know what? I'm not part of your ministry, Jesus. I shouldn't be here. She doesn't walk away. She doesn't think about any of those things. On the contrary, she believes who Jesus says he is, that he is not just the savior of Israel and not just savior of the world, but the savior of her very soul and her daughter's soul. 
She doesn't relent in her crying out to Jesus. She keeps out knocking on the door and Jesus opens willingly. I think there's a couple spiritual truths that we should take from this. First of all, how about for us, right? Have we ever gotten to the point of our life where in a circumstance we couldn't turn to anybody else for help, right? The wall was closing in. We were feeling overwhelmed. All of our earthly paths and solutions had been closed off. There was no other way we could go, right? Maybe you're going through a situation like that right now where you feel like the walls are closing in on you. Have you ever gotten on your knees like the Canaanite woman? Have you ever pleaded before Jesus and cried out for his mercy, for his help? You know, maybe you've never come to him initially in repentance and faith. Or maybe you are a believer who is going through tremendous difficulty or broken situations. Do you hear his call? Do you see what the Canaanite woman has done? Jesus isn't going to turn you away. He's not going to mock your request. He may continue to draw out your pleading. He may continue, right, to want you to come before him, to get on your knees, to humble yourself and cry out for mercy as he wanted the Canaanite woman to do. But he's going to meet you where you are as he met this Canaanite woman. He's going to meet you where you are in his love, his mercy, and his grace. So that's the first part. Now the second part of Matthew 15, uh, verses 29 through 39 uh, we see a miracle here from Matthew four, in, in Matthew 15 that is very similar to what we read in Matthew chapter 14. So in Matthew chapter 14, right, Jesus feeds 5,000. Here, Jesus is going to feed the 4,000. Now, uh, what, your lesson actually had a question on this and gave us the opportunity to compare and contrast these miracles because they're very similar and different in some ways. Now, obviously, the first difference is that Jesus in Matthew four, uh, 14 feeds the 5,000. Here he's feeding the 4,000, and by the way, that number is probably a lot more because Matthew notes that that number did not include uh, women and children, so it's 4,000 plus, right, that Jesus is feeding. But the big difference here in Matthew 15 is that Jesus is still in Gentile territory. Verses 29 through 31 of Matthew 15 are showing that Jesus is extending his healing, his compassion to the Gentiles. So much so that these Gentiles are praising the God of Israel. Truly a remarkable thing. And verse 32 tells us that his compassion is great for these hungry crowds of people who have come to be with the Messiah. So Wayne says, okay, so what can I do? What can I do? How am I going to extend my compassion and mercy on this hungry crowd? We are again seeing the glorious news of the gospel that Christ's salvation for the sinner is not just available For his own people, the people of Israel, but actually for the world. Jesus truly is the savior of the world. He came for us. He came for people like me and you. And again, there were few resources, right, at hand for Jesus. There were seven loaves of bread and few fish, just uh, very similar to Matthew 14. But with very little, Jesus Jesus accomplishes much. And I love verse 37, right? After he multiplies the food, and he, f- he feeds the, fi- the 4,000 plus. The people, the crowd, they eat, as verse 37 tells us, and they were satisfied. How awesome is that? I think one of the big lessons and takeaways here is we come to Jesus, and we're going to experience true satisfaction. We're going to experience, we're going to eat, and we are going to be satisfied. How comforting is that in a world that often offers us empty substitutes? This is going to lead us to our final principle today from Matthew 15, which is that only true faith in Jesus Christ satisfies our deepest need. Only true faith in Jesus Christ satisfies our deepest need. So as we conclude from Matthew 15, I want to break up what we just learned in this passage for two different audiences that might be listening to this lecture today. So first, the first audience is the unbeliever. So maybe you're somebody who would consider yourselves a skeptic, a skeptic to religion, a skeptic to the gospel of Christ. Or perhaps if you're honest, you're not totally sold on this whole Jesus thing. Or if you're honest, you just haven't given your life in repentance and faith. Maybe you've been around the church for a long time. You've been around Bible study, but you just haven't committed your life to Jesus Christ. Do you hear the words of Jesus in Matthew 15? Do you hear his call? The fact of the matter is Jesus doesn't mince any words. The greatest predicament that you face, the greatest problem in your life is not what you're experiencing in your career or your job. It isn't your lack of education or your pursuit of education. It is not 
your current relationship with someone or lack of relationship. It's not any of those things. Your biggest problem, I'm not saying that those are not problems, right? I'm not minimizing those problems, but I'm just saying in comparison, that is not your number one problem. Your number one problem lies in the depth of your heart. That is sin. It's this sin that has separated us from our creator, causing this great chasm. And this great chasm that sin has caused leads to hell, which is eternal separation from God. No amount of good deeds, no amount of outward action can solve this inward predicament. Only by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit through faith and trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord can one be saved from sin and given true eternal life in the Son. Now Christ, as we see here, welcomes everyone to his table. He won't refuse anyone that comes to him, no matter your background, no matter your context, no matter what you've done, he turns no one away. He didn't turn away a paganite woman, a Canaanite, excuse me, a pagan Canaanite woman who pleaded for him to heal her daughter. He did not refuse the several thousand Gentiles who came to him asking for healing, who were hungry, and he's not going to turn away you. He pleads for all to come to him and experience the riches of his grace and love. Now, right this moment is the time for salvation, and it can only be found in Jesus. All right, so that's the first audience, right? It's this gospel plea to come to Christ in repentance and trust. And how about for the second audience, for the believer, for the one maybe who would consider themselves, right, a follower of Christ. Now, we may think that we've heard this story before, right? We know all about what I've just talked about in today's lecture. We can recite the gospel from memory. We know all about sin. We know about Jesus. We know that Jesus saves us from sin. We know all of it. But do we really live out and experience the true glorious richness of the gospel? See, the reality is on this side of heaven, we're always going to be tempted to run to things, to something or someone other than Jesus for our rest, for our security, for our life. You know, especially for young adults in modern Western society, we are inundated with messaging that makes us feel insecure, that makes us feel lonely, that makes us feel as if there's a sense that we're just not living our quote-unquote best life. We're tempted to think the next job or the next career move will be what we need to make our life complete or that a relationship is going to solve all the loneliness that we experience or that money is going to give the life that we've always dreamed of. Or on religious matters, if we're struggling with habitual sin or temptation, we think that religious rituals or Bible study or showing up to church will solve the feelings of inadequacy and make us right with God. It's amazing we still do this even after we're saved, right? The fact is none of what I just mentioned is going to give us what our soul truly longs for. If we as Christians would ponder daily, Right, That our biggest problem, our greatest predicament, which is that sin that it caused separation from our creator God, has already been dealt with by Christ's death on the cross and in his resurrection. How would that change our outlook on life? How would that change the way we live? Right, Think about what Paul says in Romans 6, that we are dead to sin now and alive to Christ. We are alive. How about in um, 2 Corinthians 5, where Paul talks about how We have already been reconciled. We are reconciled to God. How does that change and affect the way we live? How does that change our perspective? So we have the greatest possible security in Christ. Our lives are spoken for on this side of heaven. Our eternity after this life is spoken for. It is secured. So maybe today you're struggling, right? Maybe you're dealing with an habitual sin. If you're honest, maybe you're even struggling with an addiction. Maybe you're trying to compensate for an insecurity or for something in your life that is going on that, if you think about it, has already been dealt with at the cross of Christ. You know, as soon as I conclude for today's lecture, you can actually run to Jesus right now. And I'm going to do this right now because I, again, I'm talking about this to myself as much as I'm telling you. Right? I struggle with these things. Right, I still deal and I'm still trying to compensate through earthly means, through secular means, rather than running to Jesus. But right now, as we pray, we can go to Jesus right now. We can run to him. We can ask him to continue to be our security, to remind us of our new identity in him, 
to provide for us the abundant life that he has given us through his spirit. He's not going to turn any of us away when we come to him in that plea for mercy. When we meet Jesus in quiet solitude, right, in the daily reading of his word, in the moments of prayer, in the community of believers as we meet with him in Bible study and in church, we're going to experience what the 4,000 plus experienced in Matthew 15, 37. They ate and were satisfied. Now, Jesus might continue to draw us out a little bit. He might continue, he, he, re- he wants us, right, to continually, not just once, but continually meet him in his word as he did with the Canaanite woman, right? He wants us to continue to come to him, continue to knock on his door. But may we experience what that group, those group, that those several thousand Gentiles experience. May we experience the riches of our, of a relationship with Jesus Christ and may we be satisfied. So with that, let's pray in conclusion. Lord, I want to just thank you for the privilege and honor it is to dive into your word and to read Matthew 15. God, the fact of the matter is, Lord, we live in an empty world. Lord, many of us are exhausted and tired. Lord, our souls are hungry. Our hearts are desperate for many of us. God, for a lot of us, we feel as if the walls are closing in. We feel life's circumstances are too broken and too insurmountable to overcome. Jesus, in Matthew 15, While you do expose the greatest predicament, the true problem we all face, Lord, you give us the great solution, which is you. Jesus, your cross, your resurrection, your gospel is the solution to our brokenness, the solution to our sin problem. Jesus, it is the peace and rest that our soul longs for. God, I just pray throughout this week, Lord, as we meet you in your word daily, as we find times to be with you alone in prayer, God, that you would provide us the satisfaction that we long for. God, I thank you that you preserve your word, that we can hear these words over and over. We need daily reminders, moment by moment reminders of your gospel, God, not just a one-time thing, but a reminder of who we are in Christ. We need those reminders continually because we are constantly bombarded by the messages around us. Jesus, would you be the satisfaction and the longing that our hearts need for your people this week. I thank you, Lord.